Because that glory has to do with uh, what affects you financially. That glory affects you physically. The glory affects everything about your life. Amen. Just the glory of God. Come on. Isaiah said, what, 60 verse, arise and shine for your light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Hallelujah. Well, um, Proverbs 29 verse 18 has been our main text for this series that we've been doing on welcome to the future. God really put that phrase in me uh, into the new year, for the new year. And uh, I, there's a lot in that. Welcome. That means you, you, we can look to the future with some expectation. Hallelujah. Welcome. You know, if you walk into somebody's house and, we're, and they say, you know, somebody, you can ever come to somebody's house and they say, what are you doing here? Uh, you know, might, you might want to turn around and leave. But welcome to the future is something that's inviting. Welcome to your future. You can make it personalized. Welcome to your future. Uh, I, I believe when we get to the marriage supper of the Lamb, Jesus is going to say, welcome to your future. Praise the Lord. And it's called eternity. Hallelujah. So Proverbs 29, verse 18, tells us where there is no vision, where there's no vision for the future, there is no revelation of God's word, the people perish. But happy is he who keeps the law. Look at your neighbor, see if they've been keeping the law. Hallelujah. They, you know, if you're people, people that are happy, you know, they've been keeping something because God's word will bless you and will help you. But just remember, you were created for a future, not your past. We're created for a future. And so you don't want to get bogged down. You want to look back. You know, if you're ever looking back, it's just because you want to remember some good things. You never want to. Uh, look back and, you know, all the bad or even the good old days. There are no good old days. I like what somebody asked Norman Vincent Peale. He was 80 years old. Norman Vincent Peale wrote The Power of Positive Thinking. And uh, somebody at 80 years old, somebody said, what was your best 10 years? He said, they haven't happened yet. <laughs> best 10 years. They haven't happened yet. He's 80. Praise the Lord. Uh, actually, oh, our Wednesday night service, Pastor uh, Hank and Pastor Mark's son, Aaron, spoke Wednesday night, and he gave out a statistic that I'd heard, but he said, actually, people are the most productive between 60 and 70. The most productive years, listen, listen, the most productive years, fruitful years are 60 to 70. The second most productive years, listen, were 70 to 80. Come on now. Most people start retiring, thinking about quitting. Right? And, then I think, and then after that, I think it was third, was like 40 to 50. So praise God. Amen. I'm fixing to turn 59. I had not even hit my best years yet. Woo, Jesus tarries. Come on now. So think about it. You're created for a future, not your past. And if the present satisfied you, then you would be at the end. You haven't hit the end. You haven't had your best. You're, you're in route to somewhere. And so... Uh, last week, we actually launched into a new direction. If you weren't here in this series, we've covered, we spent about four weeks talking about just introducing vision, and then we spent about, I don't know, seven, eight messages talking about faith and vision. There's still more we could go, but we got to kind of keep moving on here. And so we're, we're going to talk about, you know, um, perception. We've been, you know, there's different arenas of vision. And so uh, vision has to do with where you see yourself going, who you are. That's why, again, part of who you are is really growing in who you are in Christ. There's over 130 in Christ scriptures just in the New Testament. If you have never gone through your New Testament, here's a Bible study for you. Read through the New Testament and underline all the in him scriptures, in Christ, in him. Underline them, highlight them, because there's a bunch of them. And there's probably about 30 that really are specific that just are so important. And so you want to write those down. But if you were to look into a, if you were to look at a thesaurus, thesaurus, you would find that another word for vision is concept. You know, God's word are, are filled with concepts, the concepts of God, or you could call it uh, um, image, imagination, a view. And so the one that I'm focusing on right now that we're really going to, we're just taking a few weeks on, is really looking at this word perception. It's a very important word. Uh, it means, perception means sight. It means understanding. It means discernment. Everybody say discernment. Uh, it means intuition. And I gave you, and we're going to look a little more specifically this morning, but Numbers 14, 24, God said concerning Caleb that he's got a different spirit. The Hebrew literally says a different perception. I would say a different perception. So, in other words, what he saw, this means to see differently than everybody else. Now, Webster's definition of perception is the act, power, process, or product of perceiving. Cognition of fact or truth. You know, there's a lot of people, they haven't, uh, 
They haven't understood all the truth that there is to understand. We continue in the truth, and there's progressive revelation and understanding. So cognition of fact or truth, the process of acquiring knowledge, insight, or intuitive judgment. So think about that. To perceive is to, is to come to understand. It means to apprehend with the mind. I like that word apprehend or apprehension. It, it's the word to grasp. It means to you grasp something. And that's what we do with the word of God. We are to take hold of the word. We hold fast to the word. Hold fast to our confession. The best way to learn something, get a hold of something, is start confessing it. Take that promise. You might not understand all of it or how it works, but you begin to confess that word. And you grab hold of that word, and you hold fast to it because, or those promises of God. There's a lot of promises. Praise God. So, um, some synonyms of perception are judgment. Think about that. Understanding. Well, we want understanding. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Beginning of wisdom and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. So, we want understanding. We want to perceive that apprehension, uh, discernment. Remember, 1 Corinthians 2.14 says the carnal man doesn't understand the things of God. They're spiritually discerned. So that means there's a spiritual perception. A lot of Christians sometimes are just sitting, you know, two Christians can hear in a service can hear the same thing. One perceives and the other one's just still kind of wondering. But some, has, sometimes it's because of the value and the hunger of the word. How they, how they value what they're hearing. Remember, Jesus said, you know... Uh, Take, take care in how you hear. Take care what you hear. The measure that you meet, it'll be measured back to you. Hallelujah. So it's important that we want to discern. We want to spiritually discern things. It has to do with insight, observation, interpretation. So really, we, need to, we want to ask God uh, to show us his perspective. I believe that's what wisdom is. I always ask God, Lord, wisdom is seeing things from God's point of view. So Lord, what's your perspective? How do you see what? Everything. Lord, what do you, because, you know, it has to do with how you see, how God sees people. You know, God can see someone a totally different way than you see somebody. <coughs> Praise the Lord. And so we want to see people. We want to see situations. We want to see circumstances the way God sees it. Sometimes we're looking at a circumstance, and the circumstance on the outside or what we see, we might think it's the end, but God says, oh, that's not the end. Hallelujah. What the devil meant for bad, I take and use for my glory and my good. Hallelujah. So, God's greatest, really, limitation from him working big in me and through me is our perception. Really, it's our faith. It's our believing. It's our expectation. The Bible says over in Psalm 78, Psalm 78, verse 40 and 42, it says concerning the children of Israel that they limited the Holy One of Israel. Can you limit God? Well, they limited him based on their perception, based on their believing. And so, really... This is really still an aspect of faith, but, you know, again, when we ask God to show us his perspective, you have to keep in mind, really, in one form, one way he already has, and that's through his word. God's word shows us his perspective. God's word tells us how to live. It's the map that we talked about last week. And so I gave you my candy illustration last week. If you didn't hear that or you haven't heard that, where, I, you know, the Lord really um, showed me that I was treating him the way my kids had done when we went to the candy store. I was ready to bless them. And give them everything that I had, use you know, to the, the best of my ability. And so God has so much more that he wants to do for us. And so we talked about that. And then, again, keep in mind, what God sees and what we see are always two different things. That's why Isaiah 50 says, your thoughts are not as my thoughts. Your ways are not as my ways. So I gave you my word. So we can come up higher. Amen. And so really, it's like the difference between uh, if you've raised children before, it's the difference between what your 10-year-old see and what you see as a parent. How I many know that can be a big perspective? Sometimes what you're, even what a teenager sees and what you see are totally different. You know, when you're raising kids, they don't see. Like, they, they, think, they, they think they know. They think their perception is right, is right on 100%. It's not. So even, in our, even as adults, we can look at a situation and we have to ask God, that, well, back up, that's why Proverbs 3, 5 says, acknowledge him in all your ways, and he will direct your path. Because God has a way of seeing things, and we want to get his perspective. And so we actually explained what a paradigm is, and I gave you a powerful illustration last week. Go back and watch that message uh, if you didn't get a chance, if you weren't here, if you didn't get a chance to see it. Because really, uh, you know, a paradigm really becomes a way of we've been conditioned to think a certain way, 
based on maybe who we were around, how we were raised, even what kind of, uh, what, what, how we grew up, where we, we grew up in a certain denomination or whatever. You know, just because you grew up in a certain denomination, I found out there were things that my denominations or where I was, I still didn't, I wasn't taught all the truth. I had to read the Bible for myself, find out what the Bible had to say. Because sometimes people bounce around or they're really good in certain things and they, we want to cover, that's why we went all the way through the Bible last year. We looked at Jesus in every book of the Bible. Last year on Wednesday nights, that was fun. Praise God. And so we explain that paradigm, and simply a paradigm is how we think. It's how you think on a regular, it's when you go to work, how you're thinking at work, how you see life, how you're perceiving what's going on around you. It's the way we think. And so the most powerful biblical illustration of perception and vision that I can really think of that scripturally really is the children of Israel. And the Bible actually tells us to use them as an example, learn from them, because uh, here's the deal. We, if you think about this group of Israelites that God, remember, you know, that we know the story. God, you know, the children of Israel had been in bondage for 400 years. God send, raises up Moses. Moses on the backside of the wilderness for 40 years, has a burning bush experience, gets God, finds out. God says, I want you to go and talk to Pharaoh and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. And soon we know that whole deliverance, and there's so much in that, the picture of that and the deliverance of God's people but here's a group of people who, who were delivered, and they, they saw miracle. They saw God, the plagues that came upon the Egyptians. None of them came on them. They experienced the, you know, the, they applied the blood on the doorpost of their home, ate the Passover lamb. God instituted some things, and the, the death angel came through there, the destroyer, and wiped out all the firstborn children. None of that happened to Israel. I mean, you know, they just they walked out of there with silver and gold, a picture of redemption, praise God, provision, not one sick person among them. Come on, now nobody's sick, nobody feeble, everybody walked out of there, old, young, everybody came out redeemed in the blood, so many wonderful pictures in that, came up to the Red Sea, God parted the Red Sea, come on, when was the last time you saw God just part the, I mean, can you imagine what they saw, and then God followed them all the way to Mount Sinai, a, a pillar by a, a pillar of fire by night and cloud covering them. You know, everywhere they're going, they just got this, you know, three, four million people and a cloud just follow them everywhere they go. Can you imagine what other nations thought about that? People from, uh, you know, that were even in the vicinity that would see them. And that, that's why when they got to the edge of their promised land, everybody was afraid. Everybody, they, had, they, they were ready to give up and quit. They knew they were doomed. They came our way. So think about that. I mean, we think it's crazy that these people could be delivered miraculously, seeing firsthand the power of God, and then come up to the edge of the promised land and not go in. Now, there's an example for us. And God has clearly told us in his word not to be like them, but Christians do it every day. Thank you for your enthusiasm. They do it every day. I'm talking about Christians now. They think, oh, man, that, they saw a mirror. Has God been faithful to you? Have you seen his hand? Maybe he's healed you. He's blessed you. He's come through for you again and again. We're singing about his faithfulness. He never fails. But yet we come up to something new, something bigger. Maybe, and usually, it should be bigger. I mean, if you already whipped something, you know, new level, new devil, Joyce Meyer said. So sometimes, I mean, just a, a greater challenge, a greater trial, a greater, another example or opportunity for you to use your faith and see God come through as you work the word and as you believe him and, and do what you know to do, Right? So God tells us not to be like them. Now, there's, uh, I won't look at both these, uh, but up in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1 through 11, we're told some things that they did, don't do what they did. But I want us to look at where specifically along these lines in Hebrews chapter 3. Hope you don't mind reading a little scripture this morning, because we're going to look at, we're going to look in detail at this story. We're just going to walk through it. Hallelujah. But Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7, actually beginning in verse 12, Hebrews 3, 12, look at what? Again, God says, don't be like them. Two different examples, 1 Corinthians 10, and then here in Hebrews, he says, These, this is an example for us as New Testament believers. Actually, if you're going over to Hebrews 9, on, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. So several references, but he says in verse 12, take care, brethren, that there be not in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. Can you fall away from the living God? He's writing to believers here. Can you fall away from God? Well, Paul writing to Timothy said, in the last days, people, they'll be falling away. There's like a gradually drifting away, falling away from the faith. 
I didn't ever want to believe that for a long time because I'm a Word of Faith guy. Everybody likes to think, well, man, we're going to have, we're going to have revival at the end, right here before Jesus comes. That's not New Testament. I said there's nothing in the New Testament, there's nothing in the Bible that teaches that. Now, the Bible talks about a continued harvest, but we've been, har- we've, been, we've been in harvest since Jesus came. Lift up your eyes. Look on the fields. They're white for harvest. Pray to the Lord of harvest and send forth labors. And, and the gospel has gone around the world. But during the tribulation, there's going to be a harvest. When angels come back at the end, angels are going to reap the harvest. Praise the Lord. So, but there's nothing. Actually, the Bible teaches in Timothy. Paul said in Timothy. And then in 2 Thessalonians, right before the Lord, right before when we were raptured out of here, some of these signs is, is people will fall away from the faith. You know, people aren't as hungry today as they used to be. I mean, churches aren't as full. I mean, you just talk to pastors, and every, even since COVID, people are not attending church like they used to. It's kind of like they just kind of got this lull and this lethargy, this kind of a, I don't know, maybe even a, a premillennial fog or something, you know? It's like, but, the, but we do have to wake up. But, you know, it's just kind of like people are busy, and, and you, you know, it's, it's just end time stuff. But he said, take care. Take care. In other words, that's something we do, brethren, that there be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart, falls away, falling away from the living God. But encourage one another day after day. Isn't it interesting? He tells us in Hebrews several times, encourage one another. Be in church when the doors are open. Encourage one another to love and to good deeds. As long as it is still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. That's the reason you got to stay in church. That's why the reason you got to stay stirred up, because sin hardens the heart. And that's what happens. People kind of get going, and they start getting harder. And when you get harder in your heart, you just kind of get away further and further from spiritual discernment and the things of God. And you kind of start coasting. And well, you know, and you just kind of, and then you, and the deceitfulness of riches and the lust for other things creeps in, and it chokes out the word. And now you're not fulfilling and stepping into the promises that God has for you and wondering what's going on. And just, anyway, so. Verse 14, for we have become partakers of Christ. Come on, say I'm a partaker of Christ. If we, if, did you see if? You ever seen that word if? You're a partaker of Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end. You know, Hebrews talks about that quite a bit. You got to hold fast to some stuff. That's your responsibility. That's our responsibility. Verse 15, while it is said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoke me. Now, God's shifting this thing. Now, listen to this. Did they hear God's voice? Woo, man, they were at Mount Sinai, and God spoke from the fire and the cloud. God spoke to them, gave them instruction. They were, it's, it, it, it almost made them wet their pants. They said, Moses, we don't, you go, you talk to God. We don't want to go talk to, we don't want to talk to, you talk to God. Man, they were afraid. But that wasn't God's intention. They they didn't, you know, anyway. Verse 16. For who provoked him when they heard? Indeed, did not all those who came out of Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he angry for 40 years? You don't want God angry with you. You hear me? What is it that God doesn't like? God does not like unbelief. Are you here? Let's keep, I'm going to throw that out there. So, He was angry for 40 years. Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? Verse 18. And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest? Everybody say rest. What's what's the final aspect of faith? Rest. He who has believed has entered into rest. There is a rest for the children of God. And the Bible talks about the millennium being a, a rest for the people of God. I mean, we'll have that rest. God rested on the seventh day. So let's keep going. Did he not, in verse 18, again, to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? Disobedient. Why were they disobedient? Because they just weren't believing God. When God says they were disobedient, it's because they weren't believing. They, they just weren't choosing to believe. They saw it. They knew it was there. They just chose not to believe. They just said, we can't do it. And we're going to look at that. Verse 19, so we see that they were not able to enter because of unbelief. So bottom line here. Israel did not enter into the promised land of God that all that God had already had from it was already laid out. It's there. You just got to go get it. And the Bible says they did not enter in because of unbelief. Hallelujah. 
Now, let's keep going. Verse chapter 4, verse 1. The Bible wasn't written in chapter and verse, so sometimes you've got to just keep reading. Therefore, everybody say, therefore. The therefore is there because well, he's tying it into what he just said. Therefore, let us fear if while a promise remains of entering his rest, any one of you should seem to have come short of it. Verse 2, for indeed we have, we, everybody say, we, he's talking about us now. We have had good news preached to us just as they did. Uh-oh. Now he's making it personal. We have the good news. We've had the good news preached to us just like they did. Everybody say good news. What is the good news? Jesus came, died for us, was raised, resurrected. We were resurrected with him. Now everything that he bought, he did for us. It was purchased with his blood. All the provision that you need, all the healing that you need, all the good stuff that you need, Jesus already bought and paid for it. Hallelujah. But you got to lay hold of it. you got to possess it. you got to see it as yours. Believe it. Act upon it. He said, we've had the good news preached to us just as they did, but the word that they heard did not profit them. How? Because it was not united or mixed by faith in the ones who heard it. For we who have believed enter into rest. Praise God. Hallelujah. We who have believed, when you take it, you're like, oh, all right. Life is good. I'm going to have me a little rest. In other words, you can rejoice, you can give thanks, and you rest. So the good news has to be believed to be acted on. I was just thinking, it's impossible for us to enter into our future unless you mix faith with what you hear. You cannot afford to stay the same. You can't afford to stay where you are. But you mix faith with what you already know, and you take the faith you have, and you mix it with what you hear. And what's he talking about mixing? The good news, the promises of God. They're all yes and amen. So we're moving forward. Faith is progression. There's a progressiveness. And so we need to understand that what the children of Israel, here's the deal. What, why were they in unbelief? What happened to them? Well, here's the bottom line. What they saw, and we need to understand it, and how they saw determined how they saw themselves, including the rest of the Israelites. So let's go back to Numbers chapter 13. We're just going to read. And in Numbers chapter 13 is where is, they were in a place called Kadesh Barnea. And we're going to find out what exactly happened and how their perception affected their destiny. See, what you see determines where you go. Because if you want to go based on what you see, you're going to have to say what you see. If you want the mountain move, Jesus said you need to say to the mountain. But you really don't talk to the mountain if you don't already see it moving. Because you've got to tell the mountain to move. Hallelujah. You speak to all kinds of stuff. So, you might just want to, if you're taking notes, you might want to write this down. How you see or how you think determines the life you build. Woo! Because you'll also be what you say. So, how you see, how you think determines the life you build. How many want to build a good life? Well, we build it on the Word. So, we got to adjust our thinking based on the Word, based on God's promises, what He said we can do, what He said we can have, who He says we are. Hallelujah. We're going, we're, going, we're going to eat the good of the land. We're going to be obedient. We're going to serve. We're going to walk in love. Praise the Lord. We're going to be patient. We're going to be kind. We're going to, we're going to walk in the fruit of the Spirit. Praise the Lord. We're going, to, we're going to live in the Spirit. So let's look and see what happened right quick. Numbers 13, verse 1. Then the Lord spoke to Moses. You ready to read just a minute? The Lord spoke to Moses saying, Send out for yourselves men so that they may spy out the land of Canaan, which I'm going to give to the sons of Israel. And you shall send a man from each of their father's tribes, everyone a leader among them. They're leaders. So Moses sent them from the wilderness of Paran at the command of the Lord and all of, the, all of them men who were heads of the sons of Israel. So we got leaders, we got heads. And they're going out. Verse 17 says, When Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan, he said to them, Go up there into the Negev, then go up into the hill country, and see what the land is like, and whether the people who live in it are strong or weak, whether they are few or many. How is the land in which they live? Is it good or bad? And how are the cities in which they live? Are they like open camps or with fortifications? Verse 20. How is the land? Is it fat or lean? And their trees, are there trees in it or not? Make an effort then to get some of the fruit of the land. Now, the time was the time of the first ripe grapes. Praise the Lord. You have to keep in mind, the grapes just aren't for the holy, they're for the hungry. I said the grapes, that, because in Christ, we're all made holy. We're all sanctified, set apart. But you got to be hungry. You got to possess with your faith. 
Verse 21, so they went up and spied out the land from the wilderness of Zin as far as Rahab at Lebo Hamath. When they had gone into the, into the Negev, they came to Hebron, where Ahem, Shejiah, and Talmai, and the descendants of Anak were there. That's where they saw the giants. That's where Caleb said, Whoo, I see some boys going down around here. This looks like a really nice place. Can you imagine the giants had the best part? Caleb said, I'm going to figure to take like candy from a baby right here. Hallelujah. Now, Hebron was built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. Verse 23. Then they came to the valley of Eshcol, and from there they cut down a branch, listen, with a single cluster of grapes, and they carried it on a pole between two men with some of the pomegranates and the fig. Can, now, now, have you ever bought a, have you ever gone to United or something, brought a cluster of grapes? You know, one cluster, that's a cluster. One stem with some grapes hanging on. They, they had to carry it on a pole. You talk about some nice grapes now. Hallelujah. They're bringing it in on a pole, carrying it. That's some big grapes, right? Hallelujah. How do you know God, when he says, I'll, I'll give you a land full of milk and honey, man, it was good. I mean, we're talking some grapes. I'd like to see one of those grapes. Man, I've, I've actually been, I've seen some grapes, probably the biggest grape. I was actually in Estonia one time, and remember, we were in Estonia, and I bet these grapes, no kidding, those grapes were like, were like golf balls. I said, where did these grapes come from? They said, Israel. They're the biggest grapes I ever saw. I mean, just amazing. Hallelujah. So notice verse 24 says, that place was called the Valley of Eshcol because of, the, because of the cluster. Because of the cluster which the sons of Israel cut down from there. In other words, it was impressive. There were some grapes. Now, let's look at the spies' reports, verse 25. When they returned from spying out the land, and at the end of 40 days, they proceeded to come to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation of the sons of Israel in the wilderness of Paran and Kadesh. And they brought back word to them and, all, and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. In other words, whoo, look at these grapes. Hallelujah. Now notice verse 27. Thus they told him and said, we went into the land where you sent us, and it certainly does flow with milk and honey, and this is the fruit. They're still talking about the grapes. <laughs> they said, look, I mean, several, look at this fruit. Look at these grapes. Hallelujah. Verse 28, now watch this. Look, nevertheless, you got to watch out for that, nevertheless. In other words, there's a big butt right here. You got to decide which side of the butt you're going to get on. When you got a circumstance, you got a big problem, you got a promise, and God's still giving you a direction, and you got, a, you got an option in front of you, you got to nevertheless, or you can say, you know, we're going with God. Here, look at those grapes. You got to focus on the right thing. Nevertheless, the people who live in the land are strong. In other words, here we go. Here, here comes that report. They're strong, and the cities are fortified and very large. And moreover, we saw. Everybody say, we saw. The descendants of Anak there. Those, those are giants. Amalek is living in the land of the Negev and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites. They're living in the hill country, and the Canaanites are living in, by the sea and by the side of the Jordan. Verse 30, Caleb, all of a sudden, you know, I, I think God said something about Caleb because he's the first one to pipe up. I, can, I know right this while this, Caleb's getting going, oh, my God. He, he, you ever seen one of the shake my head things? Caleb's probably going, oh, no, uh-uh, uh-uh, no, no, not now. And he all of a sudden, Caleb just pipes up. He busts in. He says, wait a minute. Caleb quieted the people. He saw what was happening. He had the right perception. He said, whoa, 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 wait, wait, wait. He quieted the people before Moses and said, we should by all means go up and take possession of it, for we will surely overcome. But the men who had gone up with him, said, we're not able to go up against the people, for they're too strong for us. So they gave out, notice to the sons of Israel, a bad report. I mean, if you look at some different translations, the message is amazing. An evil, unbelieving report of the land which they had spied out, saying the land through which we have gone in spying it out is a land that devours its inhabitants. Ooh. And all the people we saw in it are men of great size. Not all of them. A few of them. They saw a few giants, but it wasn't the whole land. So they're, they're, they're already exaggerating about how bad it is. It's like the more you focus on what's bad, it gets badder. Not really badder, but worser. <laughs> anyway, men of great size, verse 33, there also we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak. More giants are part of the Nephilim. And we, now here, notice, notice what happened here. Their perception, and we became like grasshoppers. Notice, in our own sight. And so we were in their sight. 
Now, that's so important to recognize. So their perception not only affected what they saw and how they saw, but what they saw and how they saw and who they saw determined how they saw themselves. How do we, where do we get our perception of who we are? From God's Word. We have, to, we have to get in the New Testament and find out who God says we are. What are we? Well, men just camp out in Romans 8. We're more than conquerors through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We are to be victorious, thanks be to God, who always causes us to triumph. Manifest through us the sweet aroma wherever we go. Go over to chapter, now keep going, chapter 14, verse 1. Now watch this, then all the congregation. L listen, look what happened, look what happened. I mean, you talk about everybody just having a sad night. All the congregation lifted up their voices and cried. And the people wept all night long. Pitiful. They wept. They cried. They went back in their temple, their tents, and they just, <laughs> why did God bring us out here to die? In the wilderness. Let's keep going. All the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron and the whole congregation said to them, Would that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would that we had died in this wilderness. Why is the Lord bring wow? Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Or our wives and our little ones will become plunder. Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? And so they said to one another, Let us appoint a leader and return to Egypt. I mean, they just they so they're so belly hurt and aching and so much in unbelief. They're ready to go back into bondage where they came from. Pitiful. Right? Pitiful. You look at it, you read it, that's just pitiful. But what, how do we act when we get in a difficult challenge? Or we had a promise in front of us. Enemy shows up. Devil shows up. How do we act? Well, you better lift up the shield of faith. And be strong in the Lord. Know how to act. Know how to respond. Then Moses and Aaron, notice what they fell on their faces in the presence of all the assembly of the congregation of the sons of Israel. Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, of those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes. I mean, this is serious business here. I mean, when you start tearing your clothes and getting on your face before God, you know something bad's fixing. You know it's fixing to get ugly right here. And they spoke to all the congregation of the sons of Israel, saying, The land which we possess, which we pass through to spy out, is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord is pleased with us, now watch this, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Verse 9, only do not rebel against the Lord. What are they doing? They're rebelling against God. Don't rebel against the Lord and do not fear the people of the land. Now watch this, for they will be our prey. Their protection has been removed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. Listen, is God on our side? If God be for you, who can be against you? Man. Glory. I like it. If the Lord is pleased with us, verse 8, then he will bring us into the land and give it to us. A land which flows with milk and honey. Verse 9, only do not rebel against the Lord. Do not fear the people of the land, for they will be our prey. Their protection, their, their, did you notice that? Their protection has already been removed. If you got an enemy, the Bible says when you're blessed of the Lord, the enemy come at you one way and flee seven ways. You know there's seven redemptive names of God? I thought that was kind of interesting. I was thinking about it the other day. Seven redemptive, you know, Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah our righteousness, Jehovah our peace. I mean, you know. Anyway, seven, seven different ways the enemy will flee from you. Hallelujah. Verse 10, but all the congregation said, stone them. Stone them. <laughs> stone them with stones. Now, so why they're getting, they're, they're about ready to just stone Joshua and Caleb because they're trying to rise up and say, we can do it. And then now notice the glory of the Lord comes in. Then the glory of the Lord appeared in the tent meeting to all the sons of Israel. And the Lord said to Moses, how long will, I, will, I, will this people spurn me? And how long will they not believe in me despite all the signs which I have performed in their midst? Now, God's reminding them of all these different things. And he said, and I will smite them with pestilence and disp dispossess them and I'll make you in the, into, a, into a nation greater and mightier than they. Well, that'd be kind of tempting if you're the leader. Just go ahead, Lord, just wipe them all out. We'll start fresh. <laughs> but Moses said to the Lord, then the Egyptians will hear of it, for by your strength you brought out this people from their midst, and they will tell it to the inhabitants of this land. And they have heard of you, O Lord. You're in the midst of this people, for you, O Lord, are, are seen eye to eye while your cloud stands over them. And you go before them in a pillar of cloud by day and in a pillar of fire by night. I mean, in other words... Everybody can see, Lord, you're with us. Everybody sees that. 
Verse 15, now if you slay these people as one man, then the nations who have heard of your fame will say, because the Lord could not bring the people into the land which he promised them by an oath, therefore he slaughtered them in the wilderness. But now I pray, now notice he's interceding, I pray let your power, let the power of the Lord be great, just as you have declared. The Lord is slow to anger, aren't you glad? And abundant in loving kindness, forgiving iniquity and transgression. But he will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generations. You better pay attention to that. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers to the third and the fourth generation. That means the fathers, what you do has everything to do with what your kids are going to do. I mean, you get some things whipped and you make it easier for your kids. Hallelujah. You slay some devils in your life now and they won't have to deal with them. Praise the Lord. Take care of it now, but if you yield and you get whipped and overcome, your kids are going to have to deal with it. You get the victory, and your kids are just going even higher. Praise God. Verse 19, pardon, I pray, the iniquity of this people according to the greatness of your love and kindness, just as you also have forgiven this people from Egypt until now. The Lord pardons and rebukes. Verse 20, so the Lord said, I have pardoned them according notice to your word. I've heard you, Moses. And I'll pardon the people according to your word. But indeed, as I live, now watch this, all the earth will be filled with the glory of the Lord. Do you believe that? We're about to see that Haggai said that for the knowledge of the glory of the Lord is going to cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. Hallelujah. Verse 22, surely all the men, now watch, now this is what God's going to do. He's not, not everybody's getting off right here. They're leaders. Surely all the men who have seen my glory and my signs, which I performed in Egypt and in the wilderness, yet have put me to the test these ten times. I mean, no, God takes count. He's count. He's he's, God's count. These ten times, and have not listened to my voice, shall by no means see the land which I swore to their fathers, nor shall any of those who spurn me see it. But my servant Caleb, look, because he has had a different spirit and has followed me fully. That's that different perception. And he's followed me fully. I'll bring into the land which he entered, and his descendants shall take possession of it. Verse 25, now the Amalekites and the Canaanites live in the valleys, turn tomorrow and set out to, into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. Verse 26, the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, how long shall I bear with this evil congregation who are grumbling against me? I've heard the complaints of the sons of Israel. God always inhabits the complaints, but the devil inhabits, God inhabits the praises, the devil inhabits the complaints which they are making against me, say to them, as I live, says the Lord, just as you have spoken in my hearing, so will I surely do to you. Your corpse will fall, your corpses will fall in the wilderness, even all your numbered men, according to your complete number, from 20 years up and upward, and have, that have grumbled against me. Verse 30, surely, whoo, surely, you shall not come into the land in which I swore to settle you, except Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun. Verse 31, your children, however, whom you said would become a prey, I will bring them in, and they will know the land which you have rejected. They rejected it. They rejected God's promise. They just, they wouldn't buy into it. So God's got to bring in the youth group now. Got to raise up the youth group. Going to bring them in. Verse 32, but as for you, your corpse will fall in the wilderness. Your sons shall be shepherds for 40 years in the wilderness, and they will suffer for your unfaithfulness. Whew. What? What? Kids suffering for the parents' unfaithfulness? God hadn't changed, people. All right, moving around. I'll tell you, all really excited about that one. I can't camp out too. I've got to finish this right here. Man. Verse 35. Well, let's back up. Verse 33, you see it again. Your sons shall be shepherds for 40 years in the wilderness, and they will suffer for your unfaithfulness until your corpses lie in the wilderness. Verse 34. According to the number of the days which you spied out the land, 40 days... For every day you shall bear your guilt a year, even 40 years, and you will know my opposition. Verse 35, I, the Lord, have spoken. Surely this I will do to all this evil congregation who are gathered together against me. In this wilderness they shall be destroyed, and there they will die. Verse 36, as for the men whom Moses sent to spy out the land and who returned and made all the congregation grumble against him by bringing out a bad report concerning the land, even those men who brought out the very bad report, everybody say a bad report, of the land died by a plague before the Lord. But Joshua, the son of Nun, of Caleb, and the son of Jephunneh remained alive out of those men who went to spot out the land. Praise God. Now, I just want you to see all the fruit. You see what, you know, the unbelief was just God had had it up to here with unbelief. He said, said, and they knew better. 
two kinds of unbelief. What you don't know, and then you've heard it, and you just choose not to believe. That's the worst kind. But the thing I wanted you to see is between verse 28 through 33, three different times, God, you know, it says that they saw. So really, they, they were basing their response on what they saw. What they saw versus what God said. What they saw versus what God said. And we are told in the New Testament, 2 Corinthians 5, 7, we walk by faith, not by sight. You got, it's important you keep that in mind. We walk by faith. In other words, we walk by what God says, not by what we see, not by what we feel. You got to put the right thing. You got to get the right map on the inside of you. It's always our responsibility to look at the right thing. That's called focusing. That's called staying, keeping your eyes on God's Word. Stay in focus. Look, keep looking in the mirror of God's Word because what you see determines what you feel, and what you feel determines what grows on the inside of you. You're either growing that faith or you're growing doubt and unbelief. That's why you can examine yourself at times, and the Bible says examine yourself, see if you're in the faith, and sometimes you got to go, ooh, Lord, I need to make an adjustment right here, right now. Because without faith, it's impossible to please God. He that comes to God must believe that he is, right? And he's a rewarder of those who seek him. Verse 33 powerfully reveals, they said, we became like grasshoppers in our own sight. That's how they saw themselves. It's called a grasshopper mentality. That's not the right mentality. See, we are clearly instructed in the New Testament to have a conquering mentality. Amen. A conquering mentality. A dominion mentality. We're more than conquerors. We've been blessed. We have dominion. We have authority over the devil. Praise the Lord. Do you understand what I'm saying? So we're clearly instructed to do that. And so, you know, as you see yourself, who you are in Christ, it's going to determine how people around you see you. If you feel defeated, act defeated, talk defeated, don't know who you are, everybody else is going to think you're defeated. Hallelujah. How you see yourself determines how you live and what you accomplish. So you have to start working on how you see you. That's why I'm going to do a supplemental. I've got to finish up something Wednesday night, but we're going to do another supplemental on Wednesday night, and we're going to talk about thinking, thoughts, and imaginations, because you've got to wrap some things up here. So, here's the thing. You know, did you know the happiness? Happiness is feeling good about yourself. You know, you just kind of have a happiness on the inside. You feel good about yourself. Happiness is you liking you. Problem is, people like you, and you don't like you. You've got to like you. You've got to be happy with you. You've got to be at peace with God. And your heart's tender. And here's the bottom line, and I'm closing. You can never outperform your self-portrait. You'll never outperform your self-portrait, how you see you. Proverbs 23, 7 says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Hallelujah. So I said this, and I'm closed with this. We typically see things not as they are, but as we are, or as we're conditioned to see. So the word is so important, and we talked about that last week. As you begin to get it on the inside of you, it begins to change how you see yourself. That's why if you're not changed, even when you, when you get born again, you begin to come into the things of God, you have to begin to take the word and renew your mind with the word because that's why people would rather be comfortable with pain than, you know, they'd rather, they'd rather stay comfortable in pain than, than really start pursuing a future that they're not sure about. So you got to get sure about it. you got to get confident that God has something good for me. Did you learn something this morning? You don't want to go through uh, as a believer with a grasshopper mentality. Amen. We're, we're to be world changers. The people who know God, Daniel eleven thirty two 32 says, the people that know their God will be strong and do exploits. Hallelujah. Change the world. Be a world changer. Be a city changer. Be a nation shaker. Praise the Lord. It's all about how you see. I said last week, how you, our perception, you know, is only, the world is only as big as our perception. Hallelujah. Stand up. Hallelujah. Did you learn something this morning? So what are we saying? Well, we got to begin to see ourselves the way God sees us. And don't be bogged down in unbelief. Unbelief will stop anything that God had, would have to give to you. Because you don't, we don't listen. Let me say it like this. A man, a man will only have in life what he believes God for. Nothing more, nothing less. Did you, did you catch that? We will only have in life what we believe God for. Nothing more, nothing less. 
Everybody say, nothing more, nothing less. It's based on your believing, your asking, what you begin to see, how you begin to see, and where you're going, what you believe you can do, based on all based on the Word of God and what He tells you in your walk with Him. Hallelujah. Lord, we just thank you for the Word this morning. We want to be people who please you. We want to be living this life of faith, walking by faith, living by believing. Hallelujah. Lord, trusting in your Word. We thank you that your Word is full of promises, promises of good things, promises of life and health and strength. Hallelujah. We're not, uh, hallelujah, we're not like the world. We're not of the world. We're focused on you. And Lord, we thank you that there's nothing that you withhold from us. You gave us your best. You gave us your son, Jesus. So it's all about us just stirring ourselves up. Hallelujah. Possessing those promises, laying hold of them on the inside, seeing who we are. And so we give you thanks this morning. We praise you. Just while your head's bowed right now, just close your eyes. And let's just, while we're thanking God, just a minute, just worship him. Holly, if you're here and you, you know, sometimes things happen in life and people begin to identify with that situation or that circuit, somebody did you wrong or something happened. It's so easy that you'd never move forward because you're still living based on that something in the past or somebody did you wrong or somebody hurt you or this happened and you feel like it was just, man, that just set me back. Listen, God can make you have a comeback that you and him move you so far past beyond where you ever started from, where you ever came or whatever happened. He'll move, he can catapult you so fast. So far, so far, I mean, in one moment. That's why God says today, now faith. Hallelujah. He can launch you in a short moment. Hallelujah. But you got to believe. Come on, say, Lord, I believe. How you're able to do exceedingly, abundantly above all I could ever ask or even think. Notice it's connected to what you ask and what you think. Hallelujah. So let's stir ourselves up. Amen. Start possessing Laying hold of some of those promises. Even pull out some that you already have in your, in your heart. Amen. Confess them. Amen. Talk, talk about it. Talk about where you're going. That's what I, when the Lord told me to come to Love and Start a Church, I started talking about it. I started, and the more I talked about it, the more excited I got about it. Because in the early, you just kind of, you kind of scared. It's kind of new. But the more I talked about it, the more it got bigger on the inside of me. And when God gives you a direction, start talking about it. God can't move you unless you're moving. Can't, you can't ride a bike standing still. You got to be moving. And the best way to get moving is start with your mouth. Get that mouth moving. We moved to Lubbock. I didn't have a house. I, I'm driving around town look, hunting for a house to rent. I was singing. I got a house in Jesus' name. I got a house. Took me a year. I, when I was going to Raymond, I got a job with my faith. Didn't last long. Only second day on the job, I was gone. But I got it. God told me, your faith is powerful. Took me a year. I got on a federal. Took me a year. I got on a federal express. Took me a year. But that wasn't God's best. And I had too many tickets on my driving record. So God said, well, we got to let you go. Hallelujah. But you can, listen, you can get some things with your faith. I said, you can possess some things with your faith. You can go to the next level, releasing your faith. If you got enough, if you got enough unction on the inside to start speaking and declaring those things that you're blessed coming in, that you got good, you're, you got business lined up. Brother R Raymond, you got business lined up. You got so much, you got to just tell people, I can't get to you. I'm sorry right now. Just, amen. You do such a good job, you can start commanding your price a little bit more. Amen. Don't be afraid to just pick it up a little bit along with everybody. Well, you know, stuff going up. Well, you know, I'm going up too. Hallelujah. You want good work? You call me up. Hallelujah. But I see, the, I see that blessing on you. Amen. You just, just, amen. Coming up. You're going to have so much business, you don't know what to do. Like, I, I can't keep up with all of it. Hallelujah. I see teams, too. Don't be afraid to work on some good guys and you get some teams going. I see you just running, going. Hallelujah. Praise God. It's the blessing of the Lord. That makes rich and he adds no sorrow with it. But, the, but, the, but the, that rich part has to do with oversight. Some of that so the Lord will give you wisdom. Praise God. Hallelujah. You know, it's how you're confessing those things and you're seeing those things. Praise God. Ha, ha. Praise the Lord. Uh, if you don't got a ha, ha on the inside of you, you need to get you one. When you stand and you see those blessings and those things, and you just go, ha, ha. When the devil says you can't, remember Job said, at destruction and famine, I'll laugh. Ha, ha. Why can't you laugh? Well, because it ain't going to last very long. Hallelujah. I'm going to prosper right in the midst of it. I'm going to be like Jacob. I sow in famine, and I'm going to reap a hundredfold. Woo! Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Got to have a shout on the inside. Smith Wigglesworth said, if you lose your shout, you lose your clout. Got that promise. Hallelujah. It's mine. Hallelujah. I'm a possessor. Praise God. Glory. Well, I went over. 
but it was worth it. Hallelujah. Got myself happy right now. Amen. Praise God. Lord, we just thank you right now. Come on, get a hold of those promises. Lay hold of those promises and say, yes, Lord. Amen. According to your word. Come on, that's what Mary said. According to your word, so be it. And so, Lord, we thank you this morning. According to your word, we are going to light this thing up in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, you got the you got the announcements, right? All right. Well, bless you guys. It's an awesome day. Praise the Lord. Amen. Well, uh, we just want to wish you a happy Fourth of July weekend. Enjoy tomorrow, and then uh, this Wednesday, uh, Dad will still be teaching on the calling of God 